Spirit minor driver who killed two 12-year-old girls comes face to face with justice. What happened right now? Bishop Elisha Salifu Amwako's son earlier today came face to face with the gravity of his offenses when he appeared before a juvenile court in the last few hours. The 16-year-old son of the founder of General founder and general overseer of a life chapel international appeared on four charges, including manslaughter for the killing of two 12-year-old girls when the car he was driving without license crashed into another vehicle. Tonight, the younger Mwako will spend some time in state custody pending his rearrangement on November 7. The questions are there, I know. What are the charges? What could the pursuit of justice look like with a minor involved? I tell you. Well, not me. Dennis Poiberi, my producer and lawyer, has been studying the documents the police released in the last few hours of the night to help us answer some of these questions. Dennis, good evening to you. Good evening, Cam. Well, anyway. Yes, so um, the police... Four are... charges, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes, yes. So let's start with the charges, actually, mm -hmm. uh, before we come to the updates that the police have been giving us. So these are the charges that have been leveled against the... The minor, the young man. Right. Um, one is manslaughter contrary to section 50 of the Criminal Offences Act, Act 29. Neg negligently causing harm contrary to section 72 of the Criminal Offences Act. Um, dangerous driving contrary to section 11C and D of the Road Traffic um, Act 2004. And then driving without a license contrary to section 53 of the Road Traffic um, Act 2004. So beyond this, which we have gleaned from the charge sheet, mm. the police have also been giving us an update as to what has become of the young man now. And they say the 16-year-old um, suspect driver involved in the fatal East Legon accident, which occurred on October 12th, claiming lives of two people, has been remanded into custody by the Accra Juvenile and Family Court. What is of importance is this, the fact that the suspect was put before court today, 1st November. Now, this is important because... When you look at um, juvenile offenses right. and the procedure that is adopted in dealing with such cases, it's quite different. And of course, the juvenile offenses, um, the Juvenile Justice Act specifically says that um, juveniles should be handled differently from adults. Absolutely. This day is important because what it means is that time begins to run with respect to the trial. Mm. So that if after six months they are unable to complete the case or that unable to dispose of the case, it means that the offender or the accused person in this case would have to be discharged. Which means that and the, he cannot the, be arrested on the same set of facts. I see. Which means that the police is racing against time right now. Yes. So prosecution actually is racing against time and not just prosecution. The courts too would also have to play a I part see. in all of this. Which but means, this is very important. Indeed. Which means also that, you know, the wheel of justice cannot be grinding as slow as we, not we in usually this particular not, not in this particular case. Not and at all. When does the six months start to count? So it's, it begins from the first time the accused person or the suspect in this case, there is crime as a suspect. Now he's been officially charged, so he becomes an accused person. Um, that's 1st November. On the so this is the first is time today. he's been put before court. Mm. Six, six months from now, six the months case now should have should concluded. Be completed. Else he has to be discharged. I see. And, and, and then also, you, you know, you explained earlier to me the constitution of the court that c can hear this case yes. involving a minor. Talk to us about that. So a juvenile court basically is, 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 is composed differently. So you have a magistrate and then two other persons, one of whom must be a social uh, welfare officer. And then the other person will be someone who is above 25 years of age. Those mm. people are appointed by the chief justice um, on the recommendation of the director of the social welfare. So that's panel, if I may put it that way, would be those to look into that particular matter. Mm. So when you come to matters that have to do with juveniles, it's quite a sensitive matter because the law requires that they should be dealt with in a special way. One is because the, so the law expressly states that the welfare of the juvenile should be of paramount interest to anybody who is dealing with them. Right. And that is because they want them to be protected. That, um, I mean, they are still um, children in the eyes of the law. This person, we are told, is 16 years. Mm -hmm. You would even realize that even within the range of um, juveniles or young or, or people who fall below 18, you have those who fall below 16. They are treated differently. Right. There are those who are 16 but less than 18, and there are the young offenders who are 18, uh, more than 18 and less than 21. Mm. However, there are also things and that um, 
may be of interest when it comes to juvenile justice. Right. Now, there are certain punishments that cannot be attributed to a juvenile. And I keep using a juvenile because a juvenile simply means a young offender. And, and, this, and this is despite the gravity of the offense? Yes. However, there are other exceptions, but we'll see if this would fall under any of the exceptions. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to, when you look at Section 32 of the uh, Juvenile Justice Act, it talks about prohibition of certain forms of punishment. It says that a juvenile offender shall not be sentenced to imprisonment by a juvenile court or a court of um, summary jurisdiction. So what it means is that generally you cannot sentence a juvenile to imprisonment. You can see. only be sentenced to detention. Mm. Which, which is usually the Boston homes? Yes, it used to be Boston homes. Now we call them correctional, correctional centers, centers, either junior indeed. or senior correctional centers, indeed. depending on the age. Indeed. The other thing is that a death sentence shall not be pronounced or even recorded against a juvenile offender. This is the case where the penalty of the offense ordinarily should have been death. But this would not apply in the case that we are dealing with. Now, the exception created is that where it is a serious offense, because the law... The law ad acknowledges that not all offenses are the same. Mm -hmm. So when it's a serious offense, then it treats them differently. Right. Now, these are the serious offenses that have been listed. Murder, rape, defilement, indecent assault involving unlawful arms, um, robbery with aggravated circumstances, drug offenses, and offenses related to firearms. Well, I, I don't see manslaughter or, or driving yes. without authorization. So it means that... The case we are dealing with does not fall under the category of serious offenses. Based on the law. Based on the law. That's what the law says. And basically, that's, um, yes. And now, so when this person is detained, mind you, when they're using detention here, when you imagine it in the terms of the regular trials, this ordinarily should have been the sentencing or if like imprisonment. Mm. So when they're detaining juveniles, that where a juvenile or young offender is ordered to be sent to a centre, the detention order shall be the authority for the detention and the period shall not exceed. Now pay attention to this one. Mm -hmm. Three months for a juvenile offender under the age of 16. Mm -hmm. But we are dealing with somebody who is 16. Who is 16. Let's see what the law says about that. That six months for a juvenile offender or, I mean off, or above 16 years, but under 18 years. Mm. The suspect we are dealing with, or the accused now, as we are dealing with falls under this age range. Mm -hmm. So, per the law, he could only do six months. Right. That out of 24 for a young offender, and a young offender, like I explained earlier, is someone who is above 18 years and below 21 years. Mm -hmm. Three years for a serious offense. I showed you the serious offenses. What it means is that if we are dealing with somebody who mm -hmm. had committed a serious offense, that person could go as high as three years for a serious offense. I see. We do not see that the person in question here is dealing with, I mean, mm. comes under the serious offenses. So we can only limit ourselves to this particular one. Could, you know, prosecution decide to try uh, the accused person as an adult in any case at all? Is, it, is that permissible in our law? Yes, it's permissible under exceptional circumstances again. And there's a typical example of what we just dealt with in the Kaswa case, mm -hmm. where there were two charged together. The other one was an adult, the other was a minor. Mm -hmm. In such an instance, they would try the two of them as though they were adults. However, when it comes to sentencing, and that's how when we came to the Kaswa case, the day they were convicted, only the adult was sentenced. Mm -hmm. They had to remit the juvenile to the juvenile court for them to do the sentencing. And when they are doing the sentences, I mean the sentencing, they come back to the, the detention I showed you earlier, mm -hmm. six, um, three months for 60, 16, less than 18, right, and all right. that range. So yes. And this is the part I was talking about, expeditious hearing, that mm -hmm. the case of a juvenile charged with an offence before a juvenile court shall be dealt with expeditiously. And if the case is not completed within six months of the juvenile's first appearance in court, first appearance in court is today, the juvenile shall be discharged and is not liable for any further proceedings in respect of the same offences. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to be said about juvenile justice. I, absolutely. It's a special it's area and a delicate area for that much absolutely. matter. Absolutely. Uh, but let's leave it at this. Indeed, we will. Thank you so much, Dennis. Uh, Dennis Poberi is my producer here on Ghana Tonight. He's been sharing details of what the pursuit of justice could look like uh, for, these young, uh, for, for this young man uh, whose actions led to the deaths of two 12-year-old girls.
is explained to us why this trial needs to move fast because based on the law that uh, surrounds juvenile prosecution, uh, the constituted court or prosecution needs to be done within a period of six months for the age range of the accused person in question. Tonight we know that uh, when the case was called in juvenile court, uh, the court decided that the young man should be taken to Junior Correctional Center uh, to, to await his rearrangement on November 7, which is where uh, we'll bring you more details uh, when he reappears in juvenile court again. But that's it for that uh, story. We want to turn attention up north uh, right now because residents in Boko are at risk of losing essential services as business businesses close shop to avoid being caught in conflict amid rising tensions there let's get into that right now tonight essential service providers are steadily abandoning boko in the upper east region adb the loan banking service or bank offering uh, services to the community for the past year has now closed shop. ADB's exit of the highly tense area comes only days after the Chief Justice shut down judicial services there. Our correspondents report the nearest bank for residents could be at least two hours away. Tonight, ADB in its farewell message to customers referred to them to transact business using their online platforms. But also tonight, residents in Boko or in, Boko, in the Boko area are grappling with water shortage after staff of the Ghana Water Company also exited the area. Communities affected the most include those in North and South Natinga, Patelmi, Sabon Zongo, and, uh, you know, and the likes. Now, some of the residents have been speaking to TV3. Let's take a listen to them as they recount how difficult life is without water. Indeed, you could hear some of these residents explain to us, uh, you know, how difficult life has been for them without water, with all these essential services, uh, leaving or exiting their communities because of the conflict there. I want us to take a listen to those and then we'll speak to our correspondent. Life. The type is not flowing, the water is not coming, we are fetching all water, the water too is no good. Well, uh, that truncates it earlier than I thought, but we'll fix that problem and bring you more later. But all these service providers have one common concern, the state of security. Now let's check the pulse of the area now. Castro Senyala is reporter on the ground. Castro, 6 to 6 p.m. curfew on the communities. I can imagine that there's a semblance of calm tonight. Is that the case? Right, uh, Camille, you are right. Um, there's a bit of uh, calm and serenity in the Boko Township. I just uh, returned from somewhere closer where I usually go to monitor uh, the happenings in Boko. And I can report that calm is uh, there. The security agencies made up of the military and the police are also on the ground uh, with increased efforts as far as patrolling and responding to distress calls is concerned. Mm. I see. Beneath that calm, uh, we know that there are those rising tensions community to community, which is why these companies are exiting. Now, tell us a bit more about these companies who are exiting and how it's impacting lives there. Right, Camille, you see, most of these companies have people uh, living and working there from all over the place, uh, respective of uh, the tribes or whatsoever. And so when tensions uh, are heightened and uh, the fights begin, it becomes a very uh, volatile area for uh, some of these people. And then also, if you take the case of the Ghana Water Company Limited Workers, for instance, even though they are an essential service provider, workers would sometimes have to go to certain areas. Most of the, play, most of the time, uh, major suburbs where the fights are ongoing and they have valves they need to shut or open. And when instances like that happen, they are left with no other option than uh, to protect them, themselves against, I mean, this uh, uh, fight, I mean, fights where they can't go because if they do, their lives would be at stake. Also, we have companies like uh, ADB, which has also just announced that they are exiting the area temporarily because of the security situation. Uh, some of these uh, facilities 
or, or, or companies are cited in areas where the fights are intense. And you know, sometimes they shoot, the gunshot or the gunfire is sporadic, such like that uh, you can't I mean, tell whether you are safe or not. The best is to uh, get to a safer place where you know that they, I mean, you won't be caught up in the fight. And so these are some of the concerns of these workers uh, in the area. And for them, the best is to evacuate as early as possible. We also understand that uh, some people who are even not workers, uh, but are going are traders or going about duties on the, I mean, trading activities in the market are also uh, left with no other choice but to evacuate for safety reasons. And so it's not only with companies uh, or bigger companies, but also individuals who are beginning to feel threatened because the security situation there is worsening by the day, even mm. though security agencies are doing the best, but it appears that so much needs to be done. Listen, Kasha, on the subject of water, I know you've been sniffing around local authorities. What have they been telling you about alternatives for people in these communities? Kemini, uh, local authorities are very careful to speak on the issues of Boko because they are very dicey. Uh, you might say something and then you inflame tensions. And so for that matter, they would always confine in us and not to speak publicly. But uh, local authorities say they are doing their best because it's worrisome that uh, residents have had to resort to or save water sources to be able to uh, live by the day. You can imagine five days going to a week without water. Some residents who I continue to speak with and engage tell me that they uh, have had to resort to uh, fetching water from ponds and wells that had been abandoned because they had uh, saved sources of water. And now that uh, the situation is persistent, they've had to return to these what, I mean, sources of water, which is very worrying. They can't do much with that in terms of cooking, washing, cleaning, and even drinking. And so it's a problem. Now, I've been speaking to authorities, like I said, who wouldn't want to speak because it's very dicey. But they tell me that they are responding uh, to uh, the distress calls for uh, the availability, for water to be right. available for these people. And we are continuing to engage in them. I see. Castro, uh, just hang on for me. I want to bring in Dr. Victor Doke who is a, a security a consultant and a lecturer at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. Doc, good evening to you. I'm going to put you on the back burner just for a tad while I finish with our correspondent, but thank you so much for joining us here tonight. Castro, listen, you. when we zoom out and we'll look at the issues, one of the things we'll be concerned with outside of the immediate security and, and concerns of residents will be the constituencies within that area. I want to show that to our viewers now so we see the number of constituencies that could be affected if we zoom out and look at the bigger picture of whether or not these people could be disenfranchised. We have Binduri, Pusiga, Boko Central, Zebula, Bongo, and we know there are excesses overflowing into Borga. So there is Bogatanga Central, Borga East, Bolsa North and South, Shianapaga, and Garu. These areas are also likely to be caught in the situation in the Boko uh, area at the moment. But I want to talk to you about this situation because then there are those who are also very concerned about the political underlinings there. What do residents tell you, really? Uh, Kevin, the fears of residents, as far as uh, voting is concerned, is that they don't want the situation to reach a level where a state of emergency be called in the area and that would mean disenfranchising them when it comes to the elections on december 7th uh, they are uh, concerned that if this fight continue to persist uh, government and uh, i mean especially will not have any option than to uh, declare a state of emergency and that would mean they will be able to choose leaders for the next uh, big government which is very much of a concern but in all they are i mean hopeful that very soon uh, the state with, it, uh, with its actors, such as the military and the, the police and other state security agencies, will, able, will be able to quickly uh, bring this conflict to a closure by engaging the feuding factions to finding a less than solutions to the problem. Kasha, we'll leave it here. Thank you so much for joining us. We can now bring in again uh, Dr. Victor Dr. Docker, uh, security consultant. Doc, good evening to you. Uh, and thank you once Hello. again for, indeed, thank you once again for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Uh, we, we're seeing some of these essential services packing bags and leaving. No more response to a situation like this? Well, thank you very much. I think uh, in a normal situation like this, you would obviously have um, people or services, institutions, um, fearing for the lives of, of the workers. 
and even their own lives. But in this situation, with this kind of emergency situation we have in Boko, it is not right. But I would say the services, essential services like water, they should take a second look at the situation on, on pulling out because water is an essential commodity. Now, take for instance, you have even a refugee camp that we know how, how essential water is with regards to, you know, the persons of concern, let alone you have an area, okay, vast like Boko, where people are going to rely on water for farming, for domestic use and other services, even in the hospitals. What if there is an outbreak of a disease? What then happens? So I think they should take a second look at it. With regards to billing and all that, as I heard earlier on in the discussion, I think the billing and all that can be done easily with regards to just giving them a quota as they've been paid in the, in the past or whatever. Reading the meters for fear of life, I don't think it's, it's, it's necessary now. They can just give them the quota mm -hmm. to be paying every month. But I think water is essential. The people Indeed. need the water. But byproducts of situations like this are, you know, what we see. Essential services attempting to leave this community for their own safety. Would expect the government of the day then to be able to reach out to the people and help them, you know, the best way possible. What, what, what are the expectations you have of government and the security agencies now that we know there is, you know, water shortage in certain areas? Yeah, so now this, this incident, the aftermath of uh, Mr. Seidu entering into Boko, the consequences we've seen, services closing up, all of this tells us, okay, when you analyze it clearly, that there, there is a big challenge with regards to how government or central government is handling the issue, either through the chieftaincy ministry, through the National Peace Council or the security services. There is what I call the lack of contingency plan, an emergency plan with regards to solving the immediate issue, which is how do we bring some relative peace there with regards to the said gentleman in there right now. So government is aware. When I heard the Chief Tessie Minister speaking, he made mention for the fact that a said gentleman in there would mean that there would be peace because Kusasis will not agree with regards to the said gentleman being there. And now, how do you even go to convince a said gentleman to come out of Boko? Okay, it will take another step or process, right? So now what the government needs to do is to come out clearly, okay? Through the Chief Tenancy Ministry or the National Peace Council, let's have a roadmap. First of all, how do we convince the said Sadie that his presence in Boko means no end to violence? That is the first step. Then you can now continue from where you left off with regards to resolution aspects or even addressing the conflict itself. Other than that, we'll be running in circles. Mm -hmm. but let, let's not forget the resources that are being spent for these security services in there. The amount of money that is being spent on them for the peacekeeping aspect and all that, it is very boring. Mm. So I think I plead... The, 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 the state institutions, the heads, should rally around, get to the table, get the essential stakeholders involved, and then call this said gentleman and let him know his presence there would mean there was, there's, there's not going to be an end to the chaos that we are experiencing. And if we, if we want to address, a, want to address what actually is a problem, then we should start with that. Mm. You know, at the moment, we know that there is a six to six curfew there. Uh, from where you sit, for how long do you think this would work? Yeah, so Kimani, the, the issue is, you see, from when have we heard about curfews being imposed, the issues about deployment and all of that, 
see, we see this mechanism as sort of the only way that the central government is comfortable with. Yes, it is essential that when you have clashes, you're sending the troops, okay, in there, and then to care of the clashes. But this in itself is only a direct prevention measure. It is supposed to address the immediate, okay, eminent, you know, crisis, which, is, which has been done. Now, when you're talking about the other structural preventive mechanisms, you're supposed to be engaged in sustained engagement with the two sides, okay? Either through eminent people or what about the inter-ethnic peace committee that has been established, okay? We are not talking about it. I don't know whether it, it's still active or not. That committee was set up specifically to look at this specific issue. Okay, they have members from both sides. They have CSO's builder, who is a peace building facilitator, okay, who liaises with the committee, the government, National Peace Council, and all stakeholders that are relevant to this particular issue. So with curfews, yes, it's only just temporal. But the core issue with regards to the chieftaincy, with regards to the Mapusis agreeing that with regards to the chief session, if there is any issue, there is a process. You can channel it through the litigation, and then you can talk about the others. But the curfew itself doesn't resolve a conflict such as this. Mm, I see. Uh, once again, I want to you know zo zoom out of this just a little bit. For those who have questioned the timing of the um, resurrection of this conflict in, in Boko, uh, one of the secondary collateral concerns they have had is that possible disenfranchisement of people there. The, security, the, the Electoral Commission will find itself in a very tricky situation if the next uh, 34 or so days, um, you know, there isn't a concrete plan to be able to figure out what to do uh, for the people in th in that area and its environment in its environs, what are you seeing from a security perspective uh, around the elections there? Well, it's two things. Number one, now when you talk about essential services withdrawing. Now, what about the EC officials also? Right, they would also fear for their lives. Hence, wouldn't like to you know put the, the, themselves on the, in, the, in the front line like that. Now, even if, let's, let's see the scenario, even if you deploy as much as you want, the truth, okay, to foresee that there's peace on election day, you're talking about these two ethnic groups and other ethnic groups coming out, right, on that voting that you would have them queue in one line, follow, I mean, go through the process and then cast their follow. Now, are you gonna ask them to go home after casting their ballot, okay, thereby it raises questions about transparency and all that. Yes, you can have casting agents, but by and large, we know the custom that has come with regards to elections. You cast your ballot and then people wait to see the counting and all of that. Now, you could have a system where you deploy, you give the people the opportunity to cast their ballot, and then you ask them to go back for fear that maybe declarations of results may cause another crisis so you have to synthesize them on that for them to understand the only core essential party agents will be there the other scenario what i see is one we get a set gentleman out of Boko. we explain to him these are the reasons why we want you just step aside for a moment let's have the elections so that people will not be disenfranchised okay we look at that other than that then what I see is that one, when we, we, are we are nearing the D-Day itself, it will be difficult. And that is why I mentioned that what is the contingency plan, which includes all of this? How do we ensure, how does the EC ensure that the people in Boko cast their ballots? And we all know the perception surrounding the two ethnic groups. It is perceived, the Kusasi are aligned to the NDC, it is perceived, the democracies are aligned to the NDP. 
So who benefits and who loses? And this is a this this top situation that we find ourselves in as a country, as institutions. So and, I think and, and, a way forward. And indeed, you know, considering how people can be impassioned about their political alignment, this could even exactly. inflate the conflict a bit more, couldn't it? Exactly. Now, in, in the history past with regards to the conflict, we've had, you know, violent clashes because of the elections. I think in 2000 or so, thereabouts, if I may be right. Now, these clashes stem up because of the coalition of results. Okay? So you can have a repetition. Whereby now the dynamics of politics has changed. Especially when you have the linkage between politics and chieftaincy, which is very, 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 very serious. So we have a serious crisis on our hands. Not just security, we are talking about humanitarian crisis, apart from security, mm -hmm. and then political crisis. Mm -hmm. So the honors now lies on the state institutions, the EC security services, central government, to come together and then put out a very comprehensive contingency plan. So we can see the people in Boko, you know, voting on that set day without any kind of, you know, problems. It will be tough, it will be challenging, but I think if we are able to come up with a good you know, contingency plan, we'll be able to surmount. Indeed, it, and, and you know, and history tells us that we haven't really pulled our weight when it comes to dealing with the humanitarian crisis aspect of the conflict that has plagued Boko uh, for for a very long time. But uh, look at this: we have uh, what appears to be a lack of contingency, an emergency response plan. Uh, we have the similar intentions on one hand. We also, ha you know, we are now faced with what appears to be a retrogression, retrogression of all the progress that has been made in dealing with the conflict uh, in Boko. Listen, if we put all of these to together, we seem to have a keg of gunpowder, uh, pun unintended, to go off. Uh, what could we be up against if the situation, situation persists? If the situation persists, trust me, then you're going to have a prolonged conflict associated with armed violence, associated with more casualties and deaths, which state institutions and the central government will not have any solution to. And what will happen is that the town will be isolated, there will be no services there, okay? Essential services will pull out eventually, everything will be standstill for the people there. Mm. You will have mass migration of people from that area into the urban center. And what happens then? Okay, we are talking about, you know, pressure on already less or scarce resources that we are having here. And that also brings conflict in itself. Very so well. the town will be deserted. Mm -hmm. Nothing will go on until we look at what others, including myself, have proposed with regards to Indeed. The gentleman said do, and then the process itself. Absolutely. Indeed. Hopefully, uh, you know, this is solved, uh, you know, quicker and in, in a better way. Thank you so much for talking to us. Uh, Dr. Victor Doke yeah. is a security analyst. He's also a lecturer, consultant, excuse me. He's also a lecturer at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping and Training Center. We've been talking about Boko, but we can now turn attention to other issues. The Electoral Commission and the NDC spa over transparency of ballot printing exercise as the largest opposition party raises fresh concerns. More on that right now. Now, tonight, the Electoral Commission says it is satisfied with the ballot printing exercise for the 2024 parliamentary elections. The EC earlier today took some journalists on a tour to three of six printing houses contracted to provide services for the December 7th elections. The tour to Back Press, Innerlink, and Acts Commercial comes barely 24 hours after NDC agent supervisor for ballot printing, Richard Jakba, leveled numerous allegations, including overprinting for some regions. Tonight, the party is also questioning 
EC's decision to limit the number of party agents to observe the exercise. Now, the EC in the 2020 elections allowed two party representatives as observers. But this year, the commission has reduced the number by half. Now, the NDC has given the share uh, volume of work required. Uh, one agent is not enough. Uh, that's what the NDC says. Now, listen, I want to show you the uh, first off. Let's take a look at, those are the NDC concerns, but I want to show us the... Um, the printing houses that, that are working in this exercise. Back Press Limited, that's the one uh, that was visited today. Assembly Press, Ghana Publishing Company, Axe Commercial Limited, Fonstadt Limited, Yasako Limited, uh, which is now being replaced, InnoLink and Checkpoint Limited. So now there are six in all. Remember that Yasako, I believe, was rep re you know replaced with Back Press Limited. Now let's move on to the concerns of the NDC. They've talked about overprinting of excess ballot papers uh, in NDC and NPP strongholds, as well as home regions of NDC and NPP flag bearers, like the Savannah and Northeast regions. The NDC also says more than 3,000 excess ballots are being printed. And then also one party agent as an observer is not enough, which I told you already. They are concerned also about quality assurance problems. So how about we try and understand the nature of the problems that the NDC is raising against the Electoral Commission's latest exercise. Richard Jaffa is joining me now. Uh, he's the NDC agent's supervisor for the printing of ballot for the election 2024. Uh, good evening to you, Richard. I appreciate you talking to us. Uh, tonight. But first, tell us the NDC concerns regarding the printing exercise. We've had a, a cursory uh, look at those concerns outlined, but really, you, you know your concerns. Explain them to us. Are you saying I should reiterate my concerns? Uh, no, I'm not asking for a reiteration. I'm asking you to explain where are you getting these concerns from? For instance, you talk about overvoting. Where is that from? Oh, excuse me, over overprinting. Where is that from? Overprinting. I think uh, you are misconstruing what I said. Uh, where where you got your information from? Right. So uh, then, what so I then said what? Was that, you know, uh, you know what, Richard? Let's scratch it. What are the concerns? Good. The concerns are that our agents for the various printing houses are inadequate. Judging from the volume of work that is at each of the printing houses, the various phases of printing that are in each printing houses and the way they have been, they play the printing houses operational, uh, the printing rooms have been sectorized. It's virtually humanly impossible for one person to cover all the facets of printing, printing and be able to check for anything that is uh, untoward. And those are our concerns. And this is completely different from previous printing, where the EC allowed two minimum of two agents per shift. We ran three shifts per day because the printing houses, when they start printing, they print for 24 hours non-stop. Mm -hmm. So you need three shifts to be able to monitor all the printing to protect your interest. Mm. Because in this game, there's no trust. It's about checks and balances. So now if you decide to reduce our agents from two to one, and then the, the machines are, they are printing the ballots. After printing, they move a constituency that they've printed to serializing, which is a different machine in an, another different place, even though in the same building, but in a different section. Whilst you are serializing those that you've already printed for a particular constituency, another constituency printing has also started by the printer again. So printing for one constituency, serializing for one constituency is going on simultaneously. Then the one that is finished, the machine that finishes with the serializing, they move it to go and do cutting, sorting, binding, all those other processes. 
they are all going on. One human being can monitor all because they're in different places mm. within the printing house. So there are loopholes created. But if there were two, as has been well, was going on, the two of them, they can monitor properly. If one is to go and urinate, another one is there as a backup to check. If one is to go and eat, another person is in there, inside there as a backup. If a supervisor arrives and he calls one of the agents to come out for briefing, from the printing room to come to the reception or car park for briefing, there's one inside there as a backup. But EC decided to take that backup out and make it one-one, stressing the agent and creating loopholes. Yet our opponents, because they are in government and they have state institutions behind them, You've given all of us one one agent, but they have a backup of bringing national security operatives. Two from national security, two from BNI, formal and, and now NIB, formal of BNI. And, and what do so they now, come there to do? That is the question you must be asking the EC. And these two, these people, so in total, there are four in a, per, a shift, added to the one agent of MPP, making it five. I see. Maybe they so are there we for are your. Short they are, it would seem so. Your short change, you say, but we perhaps. Short change. Perhaps this, uh, these uh, national security operatives are there for, for the protection of all present mm. at, at that printing house. Okay, I'll answer that question. What, what you are talking about, I'll, I'll, I'll clarify it for you. They are not there for any protection because in this game, there are four stakeholders. One, the police for security. And they come armed. And they are neutral body. They come for security for the printing to protect everybody. And they are the primary uh, institution for that job. Followed by the printing house. Followed by the political parties. And then the EC itself. So there are four stakeholders in this printing business mm. all over the years. Good. Now you decide to come and be smart enough to reduce our agents to one, create loopholes, and then you back the government by agreeing to let them bring national security and BNI to back them up. So in the printing room, they have these two institutions who have more personnel than the stakeholders themselves. Mm. I see. You see, and you and I know very well that it is a political party that forms a government. And right, so, so, what so, is so amazing Richard, to me... I hear what is amazing to you, but uh, what problems does that cause for you? Uh, tell us how it makes your work difficult. Mm -hmm. While we are handicapped and loopholes are created, they have enough men pursuing the same political and power agenda to cover their loopholes so the battlefield is not leveled. Right. For instance, if an MPP supervisor comes and calls his agent out of the printing room, the BNI and, and national security operatives are there to cover them up for any loophole, for anything that happens inside. If they are to go and urinate or go and eat, which they cannot do it inside the printing house, and the man has to go out, they have BNI national security operative inside there to cover their government interest. And not let nobody deceive you that government is different from MPP. <laughs> Very well. Uh, it's not different R from Richard, MPP. It's Richard. the same party that forms the government. Richard. So we are saying that level the playing field. Very well. Let's Richard. have two, two Richard, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, what I, you know, hold your fire for me. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll conclude this conversation. You don't go away. Welcome back to Ghana tonight. Let's wrap it up with Richard Japa, who's been raising concerns on behalf of the NDC regarding the ongoing ballot printing exercise. Richard, you were making the point about how it would appear that there's no level play field despite the Electoral Commission's uh, decision that there should be one agent per party. Has this come to the notice of the Electoral Commission? Because they say that the process is very transparent. Uh, 
Yes, I've, uh, it has gotten to their notice because uh, I confronted Mr. Uh, Asante uh, Kisi about it, Mr. Kisi about it. And his uh, excuse was that, that he wanted to decongest the printing, the printing house, uh, the, print, the printing floor. And that's why he reduced it from two to one. And that mm -hmm. it, uh, the previous ones were a convention and it, it, it is not a law. So what you're trying to tell me is that it's a convention, it's not binding. I see. So the he can change it as and when he, as and... See, let me give you an example. As I'm talking to you now, I'm talking to you from InnoLink. I'm talking to you from InnoLink boardroom. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm sitting right now talking to you. And this afternoon, they were doing bargain in their vault. And when they are doing bargain, it means they are bagging all the booklets that they have finished printing and ready to be sent to the to the to the, to the regions. Now our our single agent has to had to go into the vault. He was there for hours. They are counting the 50 book the 50 booklets, the hundred booklets, the 25 booklets, the 10 booklets into a bag for each constituency, and then they will seal it pack them down for easy to move them to the regions. The man was inside the vault for hours alone. While he was in the vault, which is outside the printing floor where the machines are, it's in also the vault is in a different compartment, different section, right. locked. When you enter there, you can't come out. Mm -hmm. Whilst they're doing that work, they are printing ballot papers, uh, serializing them, Cutting them, sorting them, everything was going down down the machine room. While the man was not there for hours, because he cannot divide himself into two. So whilst he was in the vault doing that bargain, and was there with the MPP agents and the other party agents, right? The National Security and BNR they were in, down there. So whatever they are colluding with the printers to do my agent will not be able to see mm. because he's not there. That is what I mean by deliberately orchestrated to create loopholes well. so that they can exploit. Very and well. that's why they bought the national security and BNI operatives there. And those people, they don't even carry name tags. Mm. Only lamination they've hung on their neck. It, no it, name, it, Richard, no picture. Richard, I'm afraid we'll have to end our conversation here. Let's pick it up again. We'll put a pen in it, pick it up again. Uh, tomorrow. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank Richard, you. Richard Jakba is uh, NDC agent supervisor for the printing of ballot for the 2024 uh, general elections. It's time for me to go. Remember that key points begins at 7 a.m. tomorrow at 2 p.m. on Sunday. Join my conversation with uh, you know, first Deputy Speaker of Parliament, Joseph Osewusu. Uh, we talked about the Supreme Court versus Parliament, you know, debacle we, we face right now. We also talked about the Techiman South incident, the fact that it hasn't been conclusion up until now. Explosive interview. I say that all the time, and I mean it all the time. So make sure you tune in to Hot Issues Sunday, 2 p.m. But what happens when your Member of Parliament wants to drop a single? Good night. Take a look. Oh